everybody. Uh, it is time to start. Uh, people who will come later may just uh, automatically join. I am Ali Toglu uh, from Koç University uh, at, uh, in Turkey uh, and uh, one of the organizers of this workshop. Uh, we are uh, organizing this with my colleagues from European uh, Joint Research Center. Uh, I hope they will uh, uh, introduce themselves later. And this work, uh, this workshop uh, came from uh, our efforts to understand how can we uh, create a social political event data, set, data sets. It is mostly about uh, protests, uh, our domain. And uh, this is our third event uh, in trying to understand uh, how it can be best achieved. Uh, being, in, being in contact with the uh, community in terms of uh, tasks that should be solved or issues that can be tackled or not. Uh, luckily, we have uh, many contributors, we have you, and we hope this uh, effort to uh, benefit the field and everybody. Uh, so, uh, I will uh, let uh, my colleagues maybe one you can introduce their part yes um thanks ali um hello everybody and welcome to the, the aspen 2020 workshop uh, i'm bami zavarella from the uh, tma the competence center on text analysis uh, text mining analysis of the joint research center of the european commission and uh, so uh, we are very happy actually to be to be, to, to be part of the program committee of this uh, and organizing committee of, the, of, of this event. We have been uh, we are a lot we have a lot of interest on on uh, information extraction in particular event extraction uh, technologies. Um, also, from the JRC side, uh, in, in, there are there are also there is also interest in in, uh, in let's say creating event uh, data sets for conflict analysis. Um, as you will see in some of the presentations, uh, maybe the second day, I think. And um, I want to credit mostly uh, Ali and the Koch University for uh, being really like a, the, 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 let's say the driving force in all this, all the organization of this event. And uh, we are very happy to have received almost 200 um, re registrations. At the moment I see 56 people registered, I guess uh, people will join according to the, to the different talks and they are more interested in, but um, um, yeah, I think um, uh, I guess the, uh, it's time to to leave the uh, the stage to the uh, well back to Ali, and then he will introduce, I guess, the the keynote, the, key, the first keynote speech, right? Yeah, uh, thanks, Mani. Uh, I just forgot I am Ali Toglo. Uh, without the name, I guess it is an online environment and people see each other's name, but in any case, uh, just a couple of reminders, uh, please raise your hands. Uh, we will get questions after the talks, and if you raise your hands, it could uh, help us to uh, sort the questions, so we would like it to be interactive. Uh, we will announce the panel, uh, we will have a panel uh, last day, June 11th. Uh, we will announce it uh, and its details uh, uh, tomorrow, let's say, and you will see updates on the website and we will be here uh, in contact with you. Uh, and for any uh, issue, just type me uh, here in the chat direct to me or you can send emails. And I hope uh, all benefit, we are already benefiting a lot. Thank you very much. And you all, uh, it will be really worth your time. So uh, now uh, I would like uh, to introduce our uh, keynote. Uh, I saw her in uh, our chat. Uh, let me, it is tricky to, to be sure people are around. Cleonat uh, Raleigh, uh, sorry if I am mispronouncing her name. Uh, she is the director of uh, ACLET, uh, Armed Conflict uh, Dataset. Uh, it, it is a project that we uh, really follow and try to uh, either replicate or uh, try to uh, learn from it. 
So therefore, uh, it is great that she could has, uh, have time for us to tell us about her work from first-hand experience. Uh, welcome, uh, Klinet. And I would appreciate if you could pronounce your name for me. Uh, and please uh, feel free to tell us much more. No problem. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I really appreciate you putting together this session under such, um, let's say, extreme and strange circumstances. So uh, my name is Kleena Raleigh. Um, as mentioned by Ali, I am the executive director of ACLID and a professor of political violence and geography at the University of Sussex. And um, in, recent, uh, in recent times, about a, about a year ago, we conducted an extensive survey looking at the differences between AI, automated, and researcher-led coding. And so I was hoping to give a full presentation about our findings. And to do so, I think I'm going to share my screen, if you don't mind, and then I'll conduct the rest of the talk with that. So it is uh, 12.06. I hope to speak for maybe about uh, 25 minutes, and then the rest will be questions. So um, I welcome questions, and I hope to hear from you. So let's get started. Ooh. Uh, this looks, let's see. I'm going to just press, yes, there we go. Please let me know if there's any, um, if there is any question doing that. I just have to, my, my knowledge of Zoom is improving, but we'll see if it's, here we go. Um, okay. Okay, it's saying that I need to leave the meeting. So let me just try this again. We can, um, we can try to see, sorry about this. I should have checked this earlier, but um, now, so should allow me to share my screen. Here we go, great. Okay, now, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Great, brilliant. So let me start with the presentation. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about, um, well, I'm gonna compare things with ACLED, which of course I would know the most about. And um, I'm gonna talk specifically about different types of, of other data programs who have a different methodology, but also a different catchment, even though um, by, by definition, all of us should have quite similar catchments and really how it is the technology itself that is making things that should be similar quite different. And um, just in case you all don't make it to the end, uh, I'm going to really be pushing probably the, the importance of researcher led rather than AI and, um, and highly automated event coding. So what are the collection concerns across all conflict catchment data sets? They include missing events, duplicating events, inflating events, false positives, false events and poor geography. Now, this is really about the content, of course, but many people would be concerned with, to be totally frank, the cost of a researcher-led data program and also the speed at which we can actually uh, produce reliable data. But in my uh, estimation, after about um, 15 years of creating researcher-led event data, I can certainly reiterate that the costs of creating researcher-led data are quite small compared to the costs of using bad data that's automated and unchecked in order to make policy decisions. And so all of these issues, missing events, duplicating events, inflated events, false positives, fake events, or fake, fake news and false events and poor geography can be mitigated. They're also, they're often mitigated through a combination of better sourcing, better coding, and also better checks. Uh, rather than throwing out the baby with the bathwater and ending up with an automated set where we introduce a lot of mistakes rather than mitigate these mistakes. Okay, so what can automation do for conflict data? It's one of the things, of course, that we're always trying to improve efficiencies. And with that, it's important to understand what kind of technologies are very useful and what methodologies are. So our um, are that conflict is changing and disorder is rising, which effectively means either you need to keep on hiring many and many more people with different language skills and different uh, catchments and different geographical knowledge, etc., 
or you can rely on, let's say, some sort of a, a technical model to capture a lot of events and hope that you can develop very sensitive uh, instruments to dis distinguish between them. But AI, in my opinion, and I think that it's a, it's a accurate one, uh, has a poor ability to capture complexity. And if we take, for example, what's happened over the last three months, four months, it would be impossible to either pre have predicted this or to accurately capture it and the variation in what we're seeing because so much of the media, for example, was focused on the pandemic that the actual information about conflict, which of course either sustained its level or increased during this time, uh, was really hidden in very specific types of newspapers, um, agencies, and uh, information sources. It had to be sought out, which is not necessarily what AI is, is good at doing. And I would, I would uh, ask that we take a little bit of a step back and actually analyze whether or not the information coming from alternated sets is a good reflection or a realistic reflection of what's happening in the world. The report that we did, which uh, set the scene between researcher-led and automated and AI contributions, really reinforced the idea that uh, the AI contributions or the AI sets or even the automated sets often did not reflect reality at all, which I'll get to in a minute. And if it didn't reflect reality, it certainly didn't reflect complexity, which is how I would characterize the modern conflict environment. So one of the other challenges is that media is multifaceted and it's very particular to states. So in a place like Mozambique, we may have 75 different sources that we're going through. Some of those sources can be quite biased in one way, but, but may have good information in another way. Whereas others give great context information, but maybe less so on the specific details. But trawling and corralling is one of the worst ways of being able to determine that kind of complexity and understand why different types of media specific to states um, require a really good knowledge of what's happening in those states. So another challenge, of course, is that inconsistencies exist in reporting, quite considerable inconsistencies. When we're thinking about how to code Yemen or Nigeria, we have to account for the fact that some sources may in fact use each other, may use the same journalist, or may actually only reflect the dynamics in a very particular part of the state, whereas many others may be reflecting dynamics in a different part of the state. And those dynamics may be in House of Fulani, they may be in English, they may be in all sorts of different ways in which we can access that information. But the AI contribution, because it is trawling and corralling, as I think Phil is going to speak to in his keynote, often just aggregates this information. And by aggregating the, this information, they've created incorrect information that we are now using. So another challenge, of course, is that information in real time is often incomplete. And this is a plea to, uh, even though AFLED produces weekly data, this is the plea to maybe cool down a bit on our need to have immediate information at all times. I've actually found that about 70% uh, of an event on the day that it's reported, 70% of the information of that, of that event often has to be redone. Either the actors, the place, the geocoordinates, the occurrences, the victims, etc., all need to be revised within three days of an event coming out. And this is especially so within difficult conflict environments, which ACLED specializes in. And so we have a weekly turnaround in order to reflect the fact that information is truly not immediate. Even if you're using verified social media or you're using some sort of very good journalist, they still are trying to, um, they still are trying to ground truth that information so quickly after an event that some inconsistencies will definitely appear. So what this all amounts to is that um, in terms of the AI being used in its application for prediction, prediction is often quite futile. Again, I would say these last three months are a perfect example of how we should not, um, we should in the future given how many things are, are quite unstable at the moment. But prediction is often futile in conflict, but best in the very short term. ACLA has developed a prediction model that looks 
between six and eight weeks into the future based on the actions of a group. And we found that this is really the only window that we can, um, that we can attest to some sort of uh, consistent, consistently correct information based on our previous models. So what I mean here in the AI contribution is that people lo lose the run of themselves, people who are predicting well into the future by years. It's simply a, to be honest, it's just an intellectual exercise. It's not useful. And it encourages bold and incorrect actions that are entirely suspended from the reality that they're required to, to, um, to appeal to. So one of the things that I think what we do is we step back and say, how are you collecting information? So of those, we have a few questions we need to answer. Which types of conflict are you interested in collecting? How often, how usable does these, do these data need to be and in which format are you expecting them to be used? Now, from there, you can either have researcher-led contributions, excuse me, researcher-led contributions and those that are machine-led. And really, the researcher-led contributions are some of the only ways that we can get to the specifics of the definitions, the types, the sourcing, et cetera. Whereas machine-led, it's the sourcing and it's the type of violence. And so in many ways, its modality of collection becomes what it actually is collecting. If I were to give a one sentence um, description of machine-led coding at this point, I would say that it's simply an ability to troll the, the internet available media. It is not a reflection of conflict. It's simply an ability to, to troll the internet related media. Whereas human-led re researcher connections are much more specific to the types of violence happening and should, should, in the best case, be creating a network of sources that can give you a very reliable, robust, and full interpretation of the conflict environment. This is the key difference. Machine-led is a reflection of the press environment. It's a reflection of the media environment. Whereas human researcher-led co uh, collections on conflict is a reflection of the conflict environment. Very different, um, very, very different catchments. Okay, so the one thing that I think that people keep on um, wondering about is the connections between these different data sets and how, how likely in one data set that's human connected and another that's AI or automated, do we see a level of overlap? And by theory, the overlap should actually be quite high. If you look at what many of these data sets, which I will go over in a second, claim to collect, they actually claim to collect the same information, which is event data on conflict. But in fact, there's a lot to unpack within that. For example, in your definition of conflict, who's a relevant actor? What is an event of political violence? What additional characteristics constitute cutoff points? Uh, what are the methodologies of capture? As I mentioned here, the methodologies of capture are the entirety of the AI universe. It's about trawling without review. And so because it's about trawling, it becomes a media related data set, just a reflection of the media, not a reflection of the conflict. And then of course, the methodologies of coding, how are events recorded and what characteristics are included? These are kind of messy questions that many AI related conflict data sets want to avoid but they are pivotal about its use. And I'll show you why in just a second. You need to consider what kind of languages you're willing to troll in. ACLED uses at this point 50 different languages to collect information. Um, and because of that, it has a much wider a range of sources through which to pick. Uh, typically, many of the AI systems are currently using English, which is a reflection of your audience. It's not necessarily a reflection at all of a conflict environment. If I were to look at Mozambique and just look at it through English language media, it would be an incredibly poor reflection of what's happening in Mozambique. The source catchments. There's no reason to believe that media accounts and event counts should be highly correlated. And I'll give you an example of this, which I think we're all familiar with. Uh, you may remember many years ago, there was a report about the Boko Haram kidnapping of the Chibok girls. Um, I believe it was in 2014. Yes, I think it was 2014. There, were, there was a massive amount of discussions about the Chibok girls. So much so that hundreds upon hundreds of kidnapping events, when in fact one had occurred. Because the automation did not distinguish between the events themselves 
they effectively trolled the media for this catchment, which had no reflection in reality. Or it is also a reflection of interest. The country of Zimbabwe is a huge interest in Britain. And the reason for that has historic, is a historical legacy and a present day one, certainly. But if we were to just compare the number of stories about violence in Zimbabwe compared to even the number of stories about violence in Kenya, in, in many ways a much more violent context, we would see that Zimbabwe is recorded as often 10 times as violent as Kenya, when the reality is nowhere near that. In fact, it's quite the reverse. And again, this is a reflection of the media environment as exacerbated by the, the methodology of, uh, of catchments in AI and automated sets, rather than a reflection of reality. So source catchments are very important. And there's no reason to believe that media accounts and event counts are highly correlated. Local sources provide distinct information relevant to specific types of conflict. I'm sure that everybody is aware of that and, um, and is fine with it. So we really want to think about what type of violence are each type of data trying to collect. And the reason being is that we find that different types of violence can be incredibly difficult to collect depending on how you're trying to get at it. Of course, if you use one method to collect all violence types, you're going to create homogeneity where it does not exist. And that can be reflected, of course, in the outputs. And then I really want to, if anything, really iterate that many automated and AI-based sets do not have any review processes. Review processes separate rubbish from actual data. If you are not willing to do any review on those data, it will be rubbish. And I think that any of us who take uh, a good look at many of the automated sets can find events in there, such as Iran attacking Washington DC with nuclear weapons that are incredibly questionable but yet they remain in there regardless of being pointed out. And this is something that, that really does um, associate, well, it kind of gives the whole practice a bad name. They have to be reviewed and they have to be reviewed with some sort of human oversight. Okay, to summarize why this matters, data set differences are capturing differences in inclusion, sourcing and methodology. They are not capturing differences in conflict. They're capturing a difference in either the media environment or the methodology, not conflict. Relying on data is um, solely report driven, theoretically defined, and then based on real experiences can lead to quite bad decisions. So the point is, is that the reason that it's great for humans to be involved in the collection and the review of conflict data is because humans are the ones who are engaging in conflict we have a better way of understanding what's happening uh, based on our knowledge. So let's compare some things here. These are actually two researcher-led uh, conflict data sets. And I bring these both up in order to demonstrate how source catchments really matter. So here we have ACLED on the left. This is, these are only conflicts that are supposed to, conflict events that are supposed to be capturing the exact same information. These are armed organized groups where there has been a certain death level, at least one fatality. You can see here that in the lower area, we have the conflict over the course of the year. You can see, of course, by the, by the, um, the graph that the number of events in ACLED starts at 60, where in January, where in UCDP, it starts at one, if not zero, in the exact same time period. Now, the source catchments are very critical. So is coding in Turkish, or coding information from Turkish sources rather than just English sources, which we do here. And we also, um, we also have collections in, in, Kurd, in Kurdish languages. So what we can see is that there is a drastic increase, which we attribute from May through from March. In the UCDP set, if you can see here, the differences at its height is 26 events at UCDP, and it's 190 at its height in ACLED. Again, the exact same events and whether or not they're, they're collected. What we have then, of course, is a decrease to about 150 events, whereas um, in UCDP, the information goes down to, again, one event in December. 
Now we can see in all English language media sources that through the course of the year, you have a dip, a very significant dip, either in the summer holidays for many journalists, and of course, during the Christmas holidays for many journalists. And in, there's often a, a lull in the, in, the, in the reporting in December that has, again, no reflection in reality and is solely a reflection of the English language news cycle about conflict. On the top, we can see two maps, which again exacerbate the difference between what it takes to collect information, even if they're both researcher led, where you're relying on different types of sourcing. What we have in the AKLED set is Turkish, Kurdish, English, and otherwise uh, information, local sources. In UCDP, none of those sources. Let's move on. Let's move on to the war in Yemen which um, again, I have chosen five different data sets here, two researcher-led, ACLED and UCDP, and three that are alternated to some degree, IQs, Phoenix, and GDELT. Now, I do want to mention that Phoenix does have a very particular catchment. It was in here um, because uh, I was asked to consider its differences, and so I did so. You can see each of the boxes in the map have the number of events and the number of locations. Um, ACLED in 2018 had 10,267 events. GDELT had 45,744. I would imagine maybe one of two of those were correct. Um, the difference in the location is quite profound. Of the 10,267 events in ACLED, they occurred over uh, 1,378 distinct locations. Despite GDELT's ridiculously high number, they occurred in 631 locations. And you can see in both GDELT and Phoenix that the, um, that the middle of the country is considered the most violent. And this area is uh, Marib, if I'm not mistaken. I think it's Marib. Marib actually didn't see almost any violence uh, during that point in time. It just happens to be the exact middle of the country according to geographic coordinates. And so an enormous number of events were associated with that location that had nothing to do with that location because it became the de facto geographic coordinate when it was unknown elsewhere. Uh, in other cases, we can see that there is a drastic difference in the amount of violence and the space of that violence, especially, of course, around the coast and in the Saudi border. Uh, that's almost reflected in no other data set. These data are good in ACLED because we have a local source. We code all of our information from Arabic sources and we have Yemeni experts on the team. This is what's required if you want good data for Yemen. It's, uh, it's necessary and it may be expensive, but it actually leads to good information so that good policies can be made rather than bad information without good policies. And you can see how that's reflected again in the time period throughout the year. The Yemeni conflict has been incredibly consistent. It has returned uh, between 750 and 850 events every month, uh, really since it started, as you can see in the APLA data set. Again, we see an increase in December, noted here in 2018. Every other data set, data set shows a decrease. Uh, no other data set uses Arabic to code the information, which would account for the fact that um, there is a decrease at the end of the year that corresponds to the Christmas holiday season. Um, again, you can see from the, um, the axis across all of them, there is a tremendous difference in the amount of information that is generated through different catchments, not just the division between researcher-led and automation, but also the differences in who you're looking to in order to provide information on conflict. Uh, the variation we see in IQs is, is, is simply not present. And it's again a reflection of the interest of the English language media in the Yemeni context, rather than a reflection of what actually happened in Yemen. Here we have a difference in conflict related fatalities from 2015 to 2018. And we can see Akled has recorded, in fact, 2018 was um, twice as fatal as almost any other year. Uh, the Yemeni conflict started in 2015, whereas UCDP, which creates conflict data 
that is heavily based on fatality counts records that as almost half as few as the beginning of the year. All of our conflict data uh, from fatality data is, is checked with our local source, the Yemen Data Project uh, found in Sana'a. And as we can see here on the fatalities, there's, a, there's simply just a tremendous difference in how people are relating this information and whether or not it's accurate. Um, I would find relying on the, on the information from, from Yemen for UCDP quite a dangerous thing to do. Here's the war in Ukraine, which again uh, is an example of how you can rely on several types of different sources and get a much different conflict profile. It's very important to recognize that not just the geography, but who's involved, its impact and its timeline drastically differs depending on which sources you're using, and which methodologies you're using. ACLED uses uh, official sources from the ceasefire violations uh, committee to look at what's happening within, within the state in 2018. We have 14,000 events over, over 568 locations. That's more than, um, than almost any other data set. Again, ex excluding GDELT, which uh, is just not accurate or doesn't include accurate information as uh, seemingly its point. Um, and, and again, I think the geography here is really pivotal to understand. Good information will give you good geographic coordinates. And if not, they should be checked with others. But simply piling a lot of information in English into a data set will result in non-usable, unusable, and inaccurate information, which is where we are with automation and um, AI at the moment. Again, I'm going to uh, just go through a few more because we can see the variety of different types of conflicts. This is the Philippines. We have two local partners in the Philippines, which is quite necessary, excuse me, given the types of violence that are occurring there. There was a UN report about it uh, that came out last week about how the government has been using assassinations, <coughs> assassinations of the opposition dressed up as a drug war in order to control the state. The, uh, the Philippine situation is actually quite drastic and dire. Uh, there's 1,144 events across 437 locations in 2018. Um, IQs records an enormous number of events throughout the state. And again, focusing mainly on Manila. Uh, UCDP has a very minimal number. Phoenix again uses uh, the capital city in the middle of the state as, as does GDELT. It, it, again, it helps to be able to collect information in Tagalog um, and also uh, to be able to have local sources confirm what we're seeing here. So almost all of the information is collected from those sources. This is the conflict in Nigeria compared again to an awful lot. I can provide an endless number of these uh, data, data references for you and I would encourage you to look um, at the paper if you're interested. Uh, I won't get into Zimbabwe or India because it's a very similar story. So from a user perspective, what, what conclusions can they draw? Is more information better, which is the GDELT philosophy? Well, everything matters and we will tell you why, uh, why, a, it, why it is important is false. Everything doesn't matter when it comes out of a conflict environment. It needs to be checked. There, the areas are rife with bias. And so including it by a trolling and corralling methodology is incredibly problematic. Fewer human, fewer human eyes in a particular lens is not better in the slightest. Conflict studies have not, uh, have not grown or have not developed from that kind of treatment. Um, and it, it really reinforces this idea that people don't necessarily know what's going on in a country and yet hope to discuss its most complex <clears throat> its most complex problems. Um, <clears throat> organizations, in my experience, don't use information in real time as we wish. So we have the ability to take some time to work out the best phenomenon to make this efficient, but I really reinforce that what I've displayed here is, uh, is I think, adequate reasons to not dive headlong into automation and AI as a solution for almost any of the problems that I mentioned that conflict data has at this moment. 
So I would say that analysis and prediction is not limited by a lack of information. We have a tremendous amount of information about conflict. One of the issues is that much of that information is incorrect because it's being collected incorrectly. <clears throat> and I, I will stop there, but I'm happy to go over uh, any of the information about ACLED in general, um, which, uh, which, which will review exactly how we've decided to source and how we vet our sources. But let me stop here to see if there's any questions just at the moment uh, through the system. Would, should I just take the questions if they appear? Uh, if it, from now on, if you want, yes. Or if anybody has any question, we can get it now. No questions at all? Just uh, raise your hand or type in the chat. I have a couple of uh, questions, but maybe I will reserve them for somewhat later toward the end. Okay, Mark, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Max. I'm I'm a research assistant at UCDP. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have a few comments and a few questions. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, for first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. It's uh, great to have the the details and and your comments on the automation process. And I have some comments on. Rather, some case specific, like the, for instance, in the Turkish case, we in at the UCDP we also have some country specific sources that we are considering. Maybe the main difference would be that, for instance, we are not relying heavily on some biased sources. Like we are not relying on another agency if another agency has a tendency to extrapolate PKK. Mm. That's or we are not relying on PKK if it extrapolates, if it inflates uh, mm. government side. But apart from that, I have another comment. Like uh, when you say that we have such differences in the events, in the number of events, the main mm. problem may, might be that we are not coding the same thing. So we don't have the protest data and we don't have the same specific, same definitions for the events. I should mention there, Mert, in all of my, ex in all of my um, comparisons here, it was solely the events that would match. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we, I did not include the protests. I did not include the riots or the strategic developments. I included only armed, act, ar armed organized events and where there's been at least one fatality. Oh, so maybe on that, we should look, again check the data. Uh, well, one question is I have like in cases like Yemen and Philippines mm -hmm. and Syria, we have lots of unknown events that mm -hmm. we assign one or two. And for instance, in Yemen case, that's probably the main reason why we have so many difference. Like you have a specific methodology to deal with unknown, unknown cases. And it's actually relevant to the automation. And how can we actually assign if we don't know. Uh, the that's, a great, that's a great comment. So let me go backwards. I'll address that first and then I'll move back if that's okay with you. So um, you're right, there's lots of unknown cases in Yemen, in Somalia, in Nigeria, in many countries. Um, and that's really where it's really pivotal to have some sort of local information on the ground. Now, the local information, as you mentioned before, it can certainly be biased about certain things. There's no question about that. One of the best ways to go around that is to actually build a network of people on the ground who have to triangulate each other, but don't necessarily know each other while they're, when they produce information. And so you can really start questioning the layers that people will produce for information by, by trying to assume whether or not somebody who's not related to that organization, not from that newspaper, or not from this uh, information source can corrupt, corroborate that information. Um, and, and some of that can take quite a, quite a while. Now, um, so we've had this discussion with bears repeating that there's many conflict events in which the, which the uh, unknown nature of the targets is intentional. And this is especially the case where militias have been hired by politicians to produce violence 
in order to have quite an immediate local result. Now, not including that information is very problematic because it gives a much different risk profile than is present in that place, right? Again, it's ACLED's intention to capture what conflict looks like. It's not ACLED's intention to capture what the media say about conflict. It's, the, it's our intention to capture what conflict looks like. So what I mean by that is where there is cases where there's unknown events, in fact, quite a lot of the information in early Al-Shabaab a lot of their violence against civilians was conducted by unknown militias. It happened to be exactly the place where Al-Shabaab had been actively fighting earlier in that day or whatever the case, but they didn't want to be associated with the AC. And so they often would send in a kind of different militia group in order to harass civilians. It's important to collect that information. And it's also important to note when they're unknown. So I agree with you that it's something that people need to think very strongly about. Um, but uh, it's my concern is, let's say, you know, usually I focus on Africa. My concern is, is that the African conflict environment doesn't look anything like what the conflict research has suggested it should look like, which is civil wars are rebels versus governments and everybody else is fighting some sort of identity conflict. It doesn't look like that at all. It's looking increasingly like in certain parts, what parts of Mexico look like, where there's a criminal political syndicate, there's cartels, there's hierarchies of armed groups. They're all kind of active in the same space and then they compete in order to clear out and create a new violence hierarchy. That's messy. And I think it's our job to reflect that mess. Thank you. Thank you very much for this comment. Thank you very much. We have a question in the comment from Benjamin Radford. Maybe uh, Benjamin can uh, speak up on the data weight. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Um, can you guys hear me? Oh, yes, thanks for yeah. your comment, Ben. I just, I just was reading it. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, thanks for your talk. I thought it was really interesting. Um, so I guess for people who haven't read the comment, um, my question is, so I agree that automated event data are great, right? You probably don't want to like target drone strikes based on automated event data. That would not be good. Um, but what is it that that causes automated event data? Like what, what is the one thing that causes automated event data to be bad or like particularly bad in your opinion? If you could fix one thing about it, what would it be? Is it just the duplication issue or is it something more about how automated event coders don't have a good sense of like the concepts that we as humans are interested in um, or is it something else? I think those are great questions and I'm not entirely sure if I can separate the two issues that I think are the, are the largest. One is that there's just simply a lack of variety in sourcing. So I think like for the, for the vast majority of cases it's English language media or a little bit above English language media. Um, and again, that's a reflection of the English language media environment, not the conflict environment. So there's that, it's a reliance on singular languages, and I would say this troll and corral method, but also the fact that it's not reviewed particularly well. In fact, if you look at IQ's data or anything else, there are really shocking, glaring mistakes in there that are very problematic and speak to, um, speak to a poor appreciation about how those data can be useful to others. So it needs eyes. It needs eyes and some knowledge. Thank you. Yeah, I just, I do want to mention, uh, you know, it's not like we, at ACLED we have a series of abacuses and we're just going through and, and, you know, hoping for the best. We do use some sort of automation when it comes to very specific media sources. Um, we have over 5,000 individual sources that we use, um, and over a a thousands of those sources are subnational, often local media, uh, and these include radio stations more than anything else. So we'll have people listen to uh, local radio in local languages and be able to discern what they can. There's great apps that allow you to, to pop into almost any location on the world and listen to the range of local radio that they have just from your phone, which are amazing. The other thing um, is that we, you know, we, we do code in over, we do collect information mentioned, and we have um, just as many local partners. And, you know, those, those, the information from those partners and languages are not going to be gettable by AI. And I would say they now make up 
the real difference in how ACLED looks compared to other data sets, which is that we've invested a lot of time in finding conflict observatories, trying to support them, giving them um, capabilities um, to collect information in a really robust way and, uh, and being able to share that then with others. So, I mean, like I said, we're not Luddites, but we understand the limitations um, of a complex environment. Does Osman want to ask this question that's appeared? Yeah, maybe Osman can speak up. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so you, you, in your previous answer, you said that uh, something like uh, ACLIT tries to find the conflict themselves, not how it is conveyed in the media, because that media can produce fake news or biased news or something. Uh, <clears throat> But if it if this is the case, like, uh, how do you measure the correctness of your data collection process then? Like, you, you don't, really you don't ground your collection process to any media, then how do you measure the correctness of it? That's a really good uh, question. So I would say that one of the big issues is not, uh, so ACLA doesn't find conflicts. We just simply cover disorder in every country in the world. So we're not, um, we don't wait for a conflict to break out before we then go and see whether or not there's a conflict there. Um, so, and a good example of this is our recent work in Mozambique, which was that uh, there was a real problem with, um, with media in, in Cabo Delgado, the Northern province that has now an insurgency that um, involves ISIS. But rather than just wait for the often English or even Portuguese language media to report on what's happening in that space, we employed experts, experts within Mozambique and experts on Mozambique to help us generate a network of journalists, stringers, informants, etc., to give us a more accurate picture of what's happening. And you're right, if we just relied on one person and that person just simply gave us information, we wouldn't be able to assess whether or not we are also perpetuating this information. So what we do is have experts in that region be able to consider consider what evidence each other are providing and triangulate it within themselves. A another really good example is that we have a, quite an extensive network in the Sahel. And there was a report that a very significant JNIM um, militant leader was killed about a month ago. And this, this seemed very unlikely to be very honest because uh, one of our stringers said, well, I have a report that he was in this market on Friday somebody saying that he was killed on Thursday 300 miles away and so through that process we were able to make sure that we did not perpetuate the misinformation that he was killed and instead uh, made sure that the stringers were actively trying to to figure out whether or not what's reported is accurate. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from uh, Weine Wopke. Maybe. Hi. Okay. Yeah thanks for the talk. I'll turn my video on. Hi, Wayne. Hi. Uh, you mentioned a couple of times about uh, policy and decisions being made on the basis of the data. So I was curious as, as to whether you work with those policy makers and who they might be and whether they might guide what sort of data you're able to collect or wanting to collect in various uh, conflict zones. If so I could say more, a bit more about that. That's an excellent question. So I'm going to start with the, again, I'll start with the last question, which is that no, they have no input on the data collection processes. Uh, no one does. Um, well, you know, obviously <laughs> I do and uh, our advisors do, but other than that, the, the data process itself needs to stay outside of any sort of, let's say, negotiation or deliberation when it comes to support or even use, to be honest. Um, in order to make sure that it's that it's uh, reliable and replicable over time too. So um, we actually do work with an awful, an awful lot of, um, of let's say government users, uh, not just uh, kind of the, the usual suspects, which would be the US, the UK, Germany, the Dutch, etc. But um, I of, also offer services to analyze data for the Ethiopian government, the Kenyan government, you're just breaking up again. Take me up on that offer, but um, but others where <laughs> um, 
and I, I would say like the, the recent, again, I'll bring back the, the new conflict observatory that we just started in Mozambique. You know, the government's not thrilled about that, as I think you can imagine. Um, but what we try to do is, is appeal to the fact that the regional governments are probably quite worried about what's happening and getting accurate information about what's happening and the patterns that are, that's occurring in, those, in that area, which is tremendously difficult, even with experts, um, is, a, is of a general use without them necessarily having any input into how we collected it. The, the point of ACLED is to be useful. So that is the, uh, the intention. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, uh, I saw a question from uh, Wani maybe, if he's still around. It, yes, I actually raised the hand. Uh, I didn't uh, write the question, but I, I think uh, Clean is already answered somehow the, uh, the question. So my idea was, my question was like whether she could uh, assess um, quantitatively or I mean approximately what's the, actually the, the, the impact on the sourcing on this, uh, on, the, on, on, the, on the mismatch between let's say the, in, in, I mean the poor correlation between automatically cor uh, generated data and accurate data. Because I mean, I think that more maybe a more kind of fair comparison of uh, the, let's say, of the, of the automatic uh, event data set generation uh, process and the, uh, the the human coding of, of, of the same data in the same context will probably be w done by using a kind of comparable or even ideally identical set of uh, uh, sources. Because um, yes, the, the duplication, gen the generation of duplicates, it's a, it's a real, is real issue, but there are actually methods for mitigating the, uh, this, this, this issue uh, automatically. Well, I agree um, totally. So in the larger report, which I, I, may, I may have sent to your organization before, in the larger report, we go through individual events and how they would be differently collected. And um, Zimbabwe being my favorite country, of course, like features heavily in the report, just because the different ways in which totally benign information is, is coded in an automated set is really worrying. Um, so, you know, location names are mixed up with people names, you know, there's about, there's, a, there's several different attempts to, um, to overthrow the government, I think, despite the fact that there was one. Um, we, we really do delve into the kind of misreading of the same information as a, as a way of showing it's not just a duplication issue, it's a, it's a readability of the complexity of a conflict environment issue. Oh, I'm, I'm really I'm happy to share that report and the slides. Much of the slides is in the report, so it might be just easier to read the report. And I'll I'll upload it to the to a shared drive for this. Yes, session. please. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much. So uh, I would have a question about actually many questions are already uh, answered. Thank you very much to the to you and to the audience. Uh, one uh, maybe last question like how sustainable is all this sourcing and reproducible uh, because computational uh, one of the aim of the computational work like more efficient more reproducible although wrong like we can fix the system and run it again kind of feeling mm -hmm. uh, what would be your opinion about those uh, I mean, I'm, I, I always am of the opinion, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, which is that um, investing in these local sources to be able to provide conflict data that is relevant to their circumstances, it has several benefits besides getting better information. It is, it is increasing the ability of internal uh, agents to be able to reflect on their circumstances and to accurately report it, which is something we want. Um, certainly we want to develop and encourage. Uh, so I would say the, the, the way to sustain this level of sourcing, this level of human research, et cetera, is uh, I don't think unsustainable in the slightest. Um, I, re I really don't think it's unsustainable. I think that the alternative is, is, far, is far worse, which is relying on data that is, um, that is quite questionable and making decisions that are often expensive, lengthy, um, and uh, can be locally disastrous. 
the mismatch between the knowledge and the geography or the knowledge and the agents or the knowledge and the impact of particular types of, of violence. If we compare what's spent um, in, uh, in, in any manner of developing states around conflict, and we compare even the intelligence that any, let's say, Western government might put into understanding what's happening in the world uh, in, in complex environments, it's, uh, it's a fraction, if that, of, uh, of that type of information. And yet it's, uh, it's public and we're very transparent about our processes. So again, I don't want to say that these are two worlds that can never meet, but there needs to be an appreciation for what's happening on the ground and for the knowledge that those people have and that, that those processes have that, that seems to be missing in, in, in uh, the automation discussion. Yeah, uh, it is really hard to match them. And this is one of our, <laughs> Uh, struggles to understand where we should not really automate and where it can really help. Yeah, I mean, um, so, I think Ali, we had discussed when we met how ACLED has done a pilot and it's moved into the US uh, environment. And, um, and that's a really good example of a place that you would think that automation would be very straightforward. Um, but actually what we find is that there's so much disinformation and misinformation within that specific environment that it still requires a tremendous amount of human researchers just to, to work through the, um, the tremendous amount of uh, distortion that we find in that media. So even though you have a really, let's say you have a ready-made environment for, let's say trawling and corralling information, you have, uh, you have problems with the accuracy of that information. Yeah, certainly. Just uh, when uh, we try to imagine a new type of event, a new type of uh, domain would uh, require all this uh, effort Aklad is spending is uh, tricky. So let's say for today. That's tricky enough. Thank you very much. Uh, we really enjoyed and benefit from your views. Are well, there any you would like to complete maybe the presentation or? Um, I just want to say that I'm really looking forward to, to uh, what's happening in the rest of the sessions and of course I'm looking forward to Phil's uh, keynote and uh, it's a wonderful initiative and thank you very much for putting it together and thank you for the questions. They were very interesting and insightful. You too. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, now uh, we have in the program to introduce our shared task and have a, one presentation about it. Uh, this is um, we, this is what we organized here uh, with uh, the other organizers. So I will share my screen and go a bit quickly uh, over it because uh, on the website or uh, in the publications, uh, if you think it will be uh, useful for you, please just ask our, ask us or. Uh, check these documents. Uh, so I will share my screen. Uh, you see my screen, right? Yes. Yeah, not this one. But another, yeah. So uh, I'm not going to make it full screen uh, because uh, it has uh, sometimes uh, it does strange stuff. So uh, here, uh, this is an effort about creating a data set, uh, trying to understand what uh, issues uh, are there to, under to collect events uh, and uh, <coughs> check in computational what computational models, models can do in this restricted environment. Um, most of the effort is about defining what you really need, uh, evaluating uh, what uh, really the computer, the automation do. Uh, this work is mostly uh, in the scope of our uh, ERC project, Emerging Welfare uh, at Coach University. So uh, just a brief note about uh, the event type we are interested in. Uh, they are protests. Uh, they can be any form of grassroots political action uh, and actions of political and non-governmental organizations that are aimed at mobilizing the public in the name. 
and anything you get you may imagine if people are on the street or they uh, somehow uh, uh, speak up it is in our scope uh, just uh, if it is a plan or a threat it should not count but uh, you can imagine maybe some threats are serious. Uh, this is a challenge for the automation because all, info all event information is there, but the time is not there yet. A couple of uh, uh, examples, like uh, union began his strike on Monday. Those are single sentence uh, events but it can be uh, multiple sentences as well. Uh, like here you have a sentence boundary. When you started the project, like we talked, okay, uh, this is the aim, we need to count uh, events based on our definition. The first step, uh, like we need to get the news articles that contain events, uh, protest related uh, articles, uh, then the sentences, in these articles and then the trigger the participants and place and time some additional characteristics so uh, we uh, organized the, we prepared some data we organized a shared task in the play uh, and uh, there was this list is longer actually uh, and those are the scores like those are numbers in a restricted environment but it at least it show us some direction about where to go which model really uh, which type of automation really helps. Uh, this, the test one means task one, document classification. Uh, and the test uh, two for the task one is the cr cross context of it. Like uh, one of the challenges in automation, when you train a model, when you automate something and you took this uh, automated system to another environment, another source can be another language, uh, it doesn't perform as good as the environment you optimize this. So one of the main aims was this one, like wanted to uh, find the most generalizable method. So the average is this, it is ranked ba based on the average of uh, all these test scores. And then you see a decrease. Uh, the second task is the sentence classification. Uh, if the automated system sees a sentence, uh, can it say whether it is uh, about the protest? And mostly aboutness of a, about a protest is whether it contains an event trigger. So this is the third task uh, in this order, like tokens, can we identify the trigger? Can we identify the time expression, the place expression? So uh, because it is averaged uh, for six or seven type of information, it is lower. And in general, token extraction is a bit more challenging. So uh, in this, uh, so when we finish this one, uh, we thought, okay, we assume in these tasks, uh, every sentence is independent from uh, other sentences. If it contains some event trigger like the attack uh, here, uh, it is uh, the other information that is found like participant or place should be about this event. But if the following event uh, keeps talking about the same event, uh, we don't really use it. When we check the uh, other studies, some people assume uh, they live with it. Some of them says, uh, we don't think it will uh, affect the results but it is really hard to uh, understand whether it will work or whether it will benefit because the space is so much, you have millions of documents. So we thought, okay, let's count this kind of events because we have a randomly sampled corpus. So why not check in the annotations and uh, try to, from event sentences, uh, can we merge these sentences when they are about the same event? So, uh, that is the event sentence score reference. Uh, the data a data point, just one more example. Uh, when you have sentences, uh, those are in the uh, their number in the document, the fourth, sixth, and fourteenth sentence, and whether they are about the same event. 
uh, we annotate it. So we just uh, transform the data to serve a purpose of this task. And then the result should be like the fourth and 14th events, uh, sentences should be uh, whatever you extract from there uh, should be count as one single event. And the sixth uh, sentence should be another event. So can we really automate it? Uh, just to uh, tell more about the, like why we felt this is a uh, required task, why we can't really just assume the number and the big data, uh, millions of documents would normalize its effect. Uh, we have uh, 712 uh, articles, they are randomly sampled. Uh, we checked how many events are there uh, per decu uh, or how many articles have more than one event. Uh, it is 60%, like more than half of them contain more than one event. Uh, so assuming all single event doesn't work. Uh, remaining documents contain information about multiple events, like, like the total of the event count comes from here, 45%. And the assumption holds uh, for 45% of the uh, events. Uh, when you say, uh, if I find event information in a sentence, uh, scope of this event, the information I can collect is restricted with this single sentence. So less than half. So uh, in this setting, uh, we wanted to check whether it can be automated. We use the clustering score, how well these sentences are clustered. This is measured by adjusted round index and F1. We have uh, macro, and, uh, macro and micro versions of it and we are calculating the traditional metric F1. Uh, the macro version uh, calculates average of the per document scores from all of the documents, independent of how many event signs are there in each document, because uh, there is a difference whether you get this information from a long or a short sentence. And the micro score weights the per document score with the number of event sentences in a document. Uh, so we have uh, baselines, uh, just to see whether an automated method do uh, better than a straightforward uh, dummy method. Uh, by mean, uh, See, we say, just assume all sentences about the same event. So put, this is a test of the metric as well. So if you have uh, 50 uh, points uh, for macro and 40 points for micro, your automated system doesn't do anything. And uh, maximum C, uh, assume every single sentence has its own uh, cluster. It is about a separate event. And we uh, trained a baseline model uh, ourselves, which is slightly better than the, these other. Uh, this is one, uh, the, the reason is the data imbalance, uh, because uh, many events actually about the, many sentences are about the same event. So we had uh, two uh, submissions, uh, thanks to Urs et al. and uh, Benjamin, uh, who just asked a question. Uh, those are the scores uh, significantly better than the uh, straight dummy methods. And uh, Ursa told will uh, now talk about their method. Uh, our baseline method, this one is a similar one, the, this one. Uh, but uh, these guys were somewhat more clever to make it work. So uh, near, fe near feature uh, terms that are in our scope and we have data for, uh, actually, the cross-context setting, such as uh, different sources, different languages. We have Spanish and Portuguese coming, and uh, different countries. Like we already work with India and China data in English. Uh, we are adding South Africa. Uh, we are adding uh, Argentine uh, and the Brazil. Uh, we don't have data for this cross-document co-reference resolution, but uh, this will be at target and uh, other level types of co-references would help us to understand what is uh, in the data, what can be captured or not. So that is it from us and uh, just contact us for anything you 
may be uh, curious about. And now, uh, any questions or comments about or clarification request about this? Uh, I have one uh, raised his hand. Yeah, Wani? No, I, I think I haven't raised it. This is from the, okay. it's from the previous, uh, I think I have to kind of lower the hand. <laughs> okay, I am taking the chat, uh, no comment. So maybe we can uh, talk more about it after the presentation, uh, presentation of Karam. Uh, Karam or Rayan? Uh, I'll present. Oh yeah. Welcome. I will be presenting, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your all cl clarification regarding the shared task. Hopefully things will be more, more clear after my presentation also. Yeah, I, I, I left some uh, details for your presentation, so I didn't go in num number of items and all these stuff. I okay. trust you will uh, clarify them. Hopefully. So let me share the screen. I hope you can see it. Yeah, we see it. So before getting into the presentation, let me first introduce myself. Uh, my name is Faye Keramers. Uh, I'm interested in the applications of NLP and also uh, privacy and security in computers and computers net computer networks. So I'm also a security related guy. Uh, I'm piercing my master's degree in uh, computer science and engineering at Sabancı University, Turkey. And uh, this was our submission. This was our work uh, named event clustering within NIFS article articles uh, with my dear uh, supervisor Reyhan Yeniterzi and Süveyda Yeniterzi. So let's see my outline. So first of all, I will give a brief information regarding the task, shared task, then the pre-processing steps that we have followed and I'll show you the pro pro proposed approach that we have followed in three steps and then I'll show the experiments and conclude our work. So in the news articles, we have some events and when we are describing those events to give some background information to the reader, we also uh, give reference to some other prior events or relevant events so that uh, we don't have a single event throughout the article. So, and uh, it is important that we cluster them, uh, whether some of those sentences in the news article are referring to the same event and the goal is to identify those sentences when they refer to the same event. And actually, uh, sentence coreference, uh, event uh, coreference resolution task is very similar to identity coreference resolution task because in this case, we just consider whole sentence as the event mentioned. But in those ones, we just consider the event mentions or entity mentions uh, to identify the uh, mentions that are referring to the same uh, event. Okay, regarding the data in the training set, we have had 404 NIFS articles with their gold standard labels provided by the organizers, uh, dear Dr. Hurrietolo. Uh, and in the test set, we have had 100 NIFS articles without any labels to not to leak any information uh, beforehand the submission. And here is the, uh, actually, as Hurrietolo have shown you, uh, we have the data, we have the URL, to get more information regarding the original art, uh, news article. And we have the sentences in quotes. This is the first sentence, for example. This is the second and third. We have the IDs and we have the clusters. For example, in here, the sentence one and two are referring to the same event. But the problem was that in the first sentence, we have also shown, we have also seen uh, some title and timestamp information in the data when we have received, received it in JSON format. That's why we also have written some regex, regular expression codes to eliminate these parts from the first sentences. So this was basically the pre-processing step that we have followed. Okay, let's get into the, uh, our approach. Uh, actually our approach, since our task was similar to some other uh, coreference resolution tasks, we also have followed mention pair model. In mention pair model, a binary classifier is used to classify the mention, to classify the mentions, uh, whether they are referring to the same event or not, or entity or not. In this one, we also use a binary classifier to detect that, to pre predict that whether two sentences in a pair, for example, are referring to the same event or not. Afterwards, using these pre predictions uh, in mention pair model, 
uh, directly a construct uh, clustering algorithm has been utilized to cluster the those sentences or entity dimensions. But in this case, apart from that, we also consider the agreements and disagreements of the sentences in a pair with some other sentences as well. And I'll describe that in step two of two in the future. So let's get into the step one. This is just directly a binary classifier. We have all the pairs, pair of sentences constructed from the news article. We group them and predict uh, as a pair, as a pairwise, we predict whether these sentences in the pair are correlated or not. So this is just a binary classification task, and we use state-of-the-art pre-trained transformer-based models, neural network architectures like BERT and ALBERT. So if the output is one, we say that these sentences in the pair are correlated. If they are, if the output is zero, they are not correlated based on the prediction. And we fine-tune them since they were pre-trained. In the second uh, part, actually this was the main uh, contribution of our work with some experiments that we have conducted. Uh, we considered the agreements and disagreements uh, of the sentences in the pair with some other sentences as well. So how do we define that agreement or disagreement? If you see right here, let's say in this scenario, we have the sentence SI and SJ are predicted to be referring to the same event so that their pairwise score predicted by the model will be one. And, but let's also we pick another sentence from the news article, SK, which is not equal to SI or SJ. If SI and SK are predicted to be referring to the same event and SJ and SK are predicted to be referring to the same event, this is, this is okay, we don't see any contradiction. So it is more likely that SI and SJ will also be in the same cluster and SI and SK, SJ and SK are, are also will be in the same cluster. But the thing is that when SI and SK is not in the, are not predicted to be in the same cluster, but uh, and uh, SJ and SK are predicted to be in the same cluster, there is a contradiction. So we also consider these cases to increase, increase this uh, initial score that has been received from the binary classifier. So let's get into the pseudocode for this, for describing this. Uh, we have the all score scores, initially an empty list that uh, has the scores. Uh, and we have the sentences in the news article. We get the sentence pairs, SI and SJ from the sentences where they are not equal. If prediction of our model is one, then we just say initial score, pairwise score is one. In the otherwise case, the initial score will be minus one to initially penalize them to not to put in the same cluster. Then the risk scoring part begins. Uh, we get the SK from sentences. We get all other sentences that are not in the pair. Uh, so SK will not be equal to SR, SI or SJ. If SI and SK are predicted to be in the same cluster and SJ and SK are predicted to be in the same cluster, we just reward them with some amount. And initially that amount for reward and penalty uh, are set to one. And if the other Y case occurs where SI and SK are predicted to be in the same cluster, but SJ and SK are not, so there's a contradiction, even though our model have, has found that uh, SI and SJ are predicted to be in the same cluster, so that we penalize. After we are deducing such penalty, the likelihood of this SI and SJ being in the same cluster will be decreased based on this uh, risk scoring operation. And we insert these scores into all scores. So in the step three, we just construct the clusters using those updated scores. And it was a greedy approach that we have followed. So when we are constructing, constructing the event clusters in the initialization part, we have again the sentences and we have groups uh, where all sentences, the group of all sentences are set to zero. So that we say that we didn't uh, cluster them yet. So they are not belonging to any cluster if the group is zero. And we have all scores retrieved from the rescoring sentence pairs. And these scores are pairwise scores uh, that we have rescored. And this part is important. We sort all scores by descending order so that in the first index, in the first element of the list, all scores list, we are going to have the maximum score with, its, with, it, with the sentences that uh, 
constitutes the pairs. And if in case of a tie in the score, we sort them in the ascending order of the sentence IDs in the pairs. So the, the pair that have the small sentence IDs will be before the other one, so that when we are constructing the clusters, the initial parts of the news article will be uh, used to cluster them. Then we, fil we just filter to ignore the cases, uh, to ignore the cases where uh, S SI and SG are not belonging to the same, are, are not referring to the same event. So their score should be higher than zero. And initially number of groups is zero, we just use it as the index to set the cluster IDs. Here is the grouping code. We have SI and SJ that we are getting from the pairwise scores. And if they belong to the group zero, this means that they are not clustered yet. They are not belonging to a cluster. So that we increment number of groups by one. And uh, afterwards, we set the group of SI and SJ to this new group, new cluster. But in the case of where one sentence was already belonging to a cluster, we should also put the other one to that cluster. To do that, we have, for example, SI is not belonging to a cluster, but SJ belongs, so that we also put SI into the same group with SJ. So this was the greedy approach we have followed. Uh, in the vice versa case, we also have the same thing. So we began to uh, cluster from, uh, by starting from the maximum score. In the finalization part, we may have already clustered all of those sentences in the NIFS article, but there may be a case where we have clustered all the sen sentences, uh, pairs where they have scored higher than zero, but some of them may not be clustered because of this filtering operation. When we filter these, there will be some uh, scores remaining that are not clustered, so that we also put them into individual clusters. So we increment number of groups again, and we just put that individual sentence into an indi individual cluster where, uh, which has a single element. And this was the finalization part where we put unclustered pairs uh, into individual clusters. So here's an example to make things uh, simpler and uh, illustrate better. We have the pairs SI and SJ, all possible pairs are constructed and we have scores right before rescoring and after rescoring. We also orders and clusters where order was determined by, by the maximum score. And when the score was four, for example, it will be the first order and we start from this part, this pair to uh, construct the cluster. And these are the elements in the cluster. For example, in this one, uh, we have seven sentences and two clusters and 21 pairs are constructed in total. So to illustrate this issue, let's look at this pair, four and 40. It, they were both were pred predicting, predicted to be referring to the same event, so that the score was one, that are co that's coming from the model, actually. Uh, but if we look at their agreement and disagreement on some other elements, like two, for example, two and four was predicting, predicted uh, to be referring to the same element, and so that they will be in the same cluster. But in the case of two and 40, they do not agree actually, because it says that two and 40 shouldn't be in the same cluster. So we should also decrease their, this pairwise score after rescoring. And in the final case, one was converted to minus two and the sign has changed. So this was uh, the point where the predictions of the model are fixed. Then we also have such issues. And if you look at before, clustering and after before rescoring part and after rescoring part, all of those scores has changed and some of them has changed time. So we have the order uh, information. For example, by starting from the maximum score, we construct uh, such a cluster. And in the second one, we have the score was two. We were considering the indices in the uh, pair so that it was two and we continue with it. Afterwards, even though we have multiple uh, score two, and we start, uh, we continue constructing these uh, clusters since uh, 36 was already put in the cluster. We don't update it. It's same in the transition between two and three steps. And finally, we get 
two clusters in step eight and step nine, where 40 and 43 actually are not put in the same cluster with four. Because of the four, for example, for four and 40, because of the reason I have described right here, the predictions of the model has been uh, fixed and we don't have uh, them in the same cluster. So they end up in different clusters because of the risk scoring methodology that we have followed. Now, let's see our experiments. We have 8% training set and 20. We have five minutes. You can use a couple of minutes more if you can just. Okay, okay. Okay, we have, I'll get it faster. We have 80% training and 20% validation set and evaluation metrics was uh, described by uh, dear Dr. Hurriyatoğlu and we, they have the baseline system that consists of two steps uh, based on the mentioned pair model. They have binary classifier as we have done using an MLP, uh, multilayer perceptron, uh, and they apply correlation clustering alg algorithm. But before getting to that part, we first compare Bert and Albert, uh, Albert or, uh, by applying the same experiment over the validation set and based on our experiment, Albert uh, uh, outperformed Bert so that we have uh, continued with Albert. And we also have compared the clustering algorithms and risk scoring uh, algorithm methodology that we have applied. And when in baseline CC, we just consider correlation clustering uh, that has been used, utilized in the baseline system. In this one, we use without risk scoring, we just apply our clustering algorithm. And in this, when we are comparing step two and three, with the baseline model, we are with risk scoring plus clustering, we are just applying risk scoring right before clustering. And based on the result, just without uh, applying risk scoring, just comparing the clustering algorithms, our clustering algorithm get a very, uh, higher uh, score than the uh, baseline model in these metrics, especially. And also when we apply risk scoring, also F1, uh, measure was uh, increased drastically. So in the previous experiments, I have mentioned that reward and penalty was one, but actually uh, they may not have the same effect when we are considering the agreements and disagreements, they may not have the same effect with the uh, outputs of the predicted outputs of the uh, classifier. So that we also try to fine tune them. And Based on our experiments, by trying different values, by starting from uh, 0 0.6 to 1, both reward and penalty was set to 0 0.8. There was not actually a clear winner for this, but 0 0.8 was uh, better than most of the other uh, values that we have tried. So reward and penalty was 1, and in this case, it is 0 0.8, and we again see a drastic uh, improvement in all those metrics. So in the final case, we, ex we trained our pipeline over the whole training set to not to lose any data and test it over the test set for submission. And our model, final model was Albert plus risk scoring with reward equals 0 0.8 and penalty equals uh, 0 0.8. And we also applied greedy approach for clustering. Then based on our uh, scores, uh, our submission has beaten, uh, outperformed the baseline model in all metrics. To conclude, we have applied three-step approach that was based on two-step mentioned pair model and risk scoring really helped to uh, fix some of the uh, predicted outputs of the model binary classifier. And our model also outperformed the shared task baseline with a great margin. And actually as a future work, we are working on to uh, integrate the classifier confidence levels uh, to the scoring mechanism so that we get more smooth, smooth predictions and the scoring uh, mechanism. And we are still working on it and it seems to be that it's giving better uh, results for us. Thank you for listening. Uh, but I also would like to thank the organizers of the task, especially Hurrietol and his team. Uh, so they were very helpful during the evaluation process and for providing data. Uh, actually, they always uh, have shown us a way to do things and they helped uh, to um, fix some of the issues that we couldn't uh, see uh, subtly. Uh, so that's it. And if you have any questions, I'm glad to answer them. And here are my references for the talk.
Thank you very much, Karam, uh, yeah, for all the hard work and all these experiments. It's really amazing. And I, I'm i sure it will progress with all these additional experiments. Hopefully. Uh, yeah. We can have a couple of one or two questions, actually. So uh, I can uh, maybe say either a comment or a question, or you already have done it. Uh, what about uh, trying to learn the penalty and reward uh, b without uh, explicit manual work? Uh, have you thought about it? Actually, we we are just trying to uh, fix the issue with the initial scores that are coming from the uh, classifier instead of setting one or minus one, we are trying to uh, set the confidence values. But afterwards, we are also uh, trying to uh, fine tune the reward and penalty values based on that maybe by ch changing or uh, increasing the range of the values that we are trying. And uh, maybe some approach regarding the uh, classifier scores may also be used. I see. Many experiments, and we are going to extend the data set with additional dimensions like language as well. Mm -hmm. I hope to be able to check it with you. Sure. So, uh, if no additional comments or questions, we can uh, proceed with uh, uh, Benjamin Rutford's talk about the new data set he proposed. Uh, are you there, Ben? Perfect. Thank you very much. Hi, yeah. Um, can you guys see and hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Excellent. Um, cool. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much for, for organizing this. It's really great to see, you know, I think we have like 60 people who are interested in event data here. So that's fantastic. Um, okay. So uh, let's see. Um, so my name is Ben Radford. Uh, I am an assistant professor at UNC Charlotte, uh, and I have been interested in automated event data for, for a while now. Um, so this is really fun for me. Um, and uh, I would say that just kind of as an introduction, I, I am more optimistic about the future of, of AI generated or automated event data generation than, than some people are. Uh, maybe that optimism is misplaced as you'll, as you'll see in this presentation. Um, but, uh, but I think long term, this is a, a tractable, tractable problem. But uh, I agree also that um, automated event data need, need improvement. Um, and so one thing just before I, I jump into this, this project that I'm gonna present um, that I wanted to mention is that uh, oftentimes I think speed and efficiency and cost are cited as like the goals for automated event data, right? Like, why are we doing this? Oh, it's fast and efficient. Um, and, and I don't think that's right. I think those are, those are characteristics of automated event data, right? They're, they're, it's fast and efficient if you can automate event data. Uh, if you have to hire translators and, and local sources and, you know, uh, human resources, uh, obviously it's gonna be slower and more costly, but, but I think the goal, the reason we actually want this uh, isn't because of the speed or, or the cost, it's because we, we want to democratize uh, data generation, right? If you only have one event data set that is like the ground truth, really expensive data set, you're, you're overstating your certainty in, in the state of the world, right? You're assuming that, that those events are, are the true events. And I, I think that um, that is maybe too optimistic and that maybe maybe the state of the world is really hard to measure and we want to democratize our attempts to measure the state of the world so that we have a sense of our uncertainty about the state of the world and the only way we can do that right is if we automate some of these tasks because you know a lot of us researchers can't afford to like build huge manually coded event data sets um and so that's what i think of as as the end goal for for um uh, automated event data and like why why we should be interested in this as an as an effort a research effort um and so to that end I, i'm going to present a, a little work here on um kind of a first attempt at improving automated event data in like a certain direction at least from my perspective which is um incorporating more context in in our uh, automation process so um so right now as, as you'll see in this talk uh most automated event data sets are coded, at least in political science, right, are, are coded on a sentence level. And I think that we could maybe make some progress uh, 
towards fixing some of the problems with automated event data if we can get past that sentence level coding. Um, and, and just a note uh, before we start, so I also uh, contributed to that, that shared task problem. It did not do very well. Uh, but do not worry, this presentation is totally different from that. So I used a, a, that was separate. This presentation is on a different method, different data, all of that stuff. Um, okay, cool. So. Um, yeah, just just a note, uh, maybe Ben is the only person who has joined almost all of our shared tasks. <laughs> yeah, the, I, Thank you very I, much. I love the shared tasks. I think they're a lot of fun. Um, the, the last one, I spent more time on this paper, and so I did not have much time for the shared task. I was doing it on my way to, um, I was flying to Abu Dhabi and then Egypt, and, uh, and I was doing it like in the airport. So um, it was not, it was not great, um, but it was a fun, fun task. Um, okay, so today what I'm going to talk about is uh, a project that I'm calling Headlines of War because I'm not very creative. Um, and this is a, a new data set for event detection and event linking. Um, new data set meaning it's a compile, compilation of other data sets. Um, okay, so, so we'll start out. You guys probably know this. What do conflict event data look like? Um, well, generally speaking, we divide them up into like manually curated data sets and automated data sets. And, you know, these are not exhaustive lists, obviously, but we have manual data sets like ACLED, which is fantastic. And we have MIDS, which I'll talk about more um, in this presentation. That's the militarized interstate dispute data set. Um, we have the ICB, the International Crisis Behavior data set. And, uh, and then automated data sets, there's several, but the popular ones are things like GDEL, um, Phoenix, and IQs. Um, which all have, have problems. Um, generally speaking, uh, the automated data sets, right, are coded on a, a sentence by sentence basis, right? You, you feed in an article, it gets split at all of the like, uh, all of the like sentence delimit delimiters, right, like periods and such. Um, and then each sentence gets coded independently of all of the others, which leads to some problems, right? So it leads to duplication, for example, you have lots of sentences that describe the same event. Um, and uh, and those might get coded as multiple events, right? And it also leads to problems like um, the inability to code events that are described over multiple sentences. So complex events are sometimes hard to code. Um, and, uh, and so what I'm gonna do today is use some of these manually curated data sets, the MIDS data set in particular, um, and try to use it to maybe improve techniques from, for building these automated event data sets. Um, one more thing to note is like, I think it's kind of a stretch to call any of these automated data sets AI generated right now. Like it's AI in the loosest sense of AI. It's like heuristics mostly, right? It's like dictionaries and heuristics uh, for generating these data sets. Um, okay, so uh, militarized interstate dispute data set, in case you haven't seen it, um, this is a, a manually curated data set. It's been around for a long time now. Um, it describes militarized interstate disputes, which are defined as incidents involving the deliberate, overt, government-sanctioned, and government-directed threat, display, or use of force between two or more states. Um, so here's an example of what militarized interstate dispute incidents look like down below. Um, so this is a dispute. A uh, dispute is like, think of it like a war, kind of. It's like a big conflict. This is dispute number 4339, which I believe is the second Congo war in like 1998. Um, they're made up of incidents. So these incidents are like sub events within a mid, right? So you've got this hierarchy now. Um, so there's like three sub events listed here. Um, and then there's dates and durations. Um, and then a, a little bit of additional detail that's hard to get if you're using just automated processes, right? So like levels of fatalities. Um, then also this thing like hostility level or action level, which um, describe categories of like how severe is this conflict, right? And that's more or less it. Um, and then also like how many states are involved in the conflict. So they're not just dyadic, they can involve multiple, multiple states. Okay, and automated event data, on the other hand, often look like this. So this is an example that, that I made. Um, I fed into a, a coder called Petrarch, which is one of the kind of standard event, uh, automated event coding tools. Um, I, I fed it the sentence, President Obama has threatened retaliation against China for conducting cyber espionage against the United States, um, which just gets coded as the United States government threatened, and that has a numerical code of 130, threatened China. So this is what automated event data look like right now. Um, and so what is missing in, in automated event data? And, and I think one of, one of the answers, one of many answers to this 
uh, is, is context is missing, right? So like I said, most of these code sentence by sentence, which means that they miss any kinds of links between events. Um, and these can be explicit links or implicit links. Um, and I think these are things that really we might want to consider finding a way to incorporate in, in conflict event data. So some examples would be explicit links that might be of interest. Um, a lot of times reporters use causal language and it seems silly to not rely on that, right? So um, events are related to one another, they don't happen in a vacuum. And so it'd be nice to know if events are, you know, retaliations for or responses to. Um, even simpler than that, it might be nice to look at, at ordering, right? Like temporal ordering, for example, um, which events follow or precede other events. Um, we could use this A just to like improve our, our sense of our, our like um, temporal estimates, right? The dates that these, these things are coded as happening. Uh, but we could also use them to, to relate events that are, are related. Even if they happen in order, they might not actually follow one another, right? They could be totally unrelated. Um, also, sometimes explicitly stated are like hierarchies, right? So, so a, an offensive might be a part of a war, for example, or a bombing might be. Um, but there are also implicit links. So there are things like co-reference, equality, and duplication, which I'm going to treat as all the same here, where event A is the same as event B. Um, there's hierarchy, where event A is a, a piece of event B or a, a subset of event B. Um, and then there's um, like implied causation or implied ordering. And I, and I think it might improve the uh, the quality of automated event data if we were to build coders that could at least take into account some of these event linkages. Um, and I'm going to focus today on, on this co-reference and equality um, relationship. So the task that I want to do is I, I want to propose that, that we should um, perhaps have a data set for evaluating how well automated event coders can link events um, link events across documents. So if you feed it multiple documents can a, uh, or sentences, can a, uh, an automated coder identify um, co-references or links between events, right? Can, they, can it essentially solve the deduplication problem? Um, that is, if you have two sentences that describe the same event, can the coder say, these are the same, we're going to deduplicate them. Um, and so, so the task here has two parts. Uh, the first is you have to be able to identify the events in text, right? Not all texts describe events of interest. Uh, and then the second task is given that you have two events, um, what's the probability that those two texts reference the same event? Um, so to do this, I'm going to introduce a new data set that I call Headlines of War. Um, so first we need positive examples, that is uh, examples of texts that describe conflicts uh, and uh, and then also um, links between texts that describe the same conflict. Um, and I want these texts to look kind of like the texts that, you know, GDELT or Phoenix or IQs would be coding. That is like single sentences that, that describe or probably describe an event. Um, and so to get these, I used um, the militarized interstate dispute data set. Um, so MIDS looks like what I showed you earlier, which is uh, this. So there's, there's no text here. Um, but prior to getting to that state, right, prior to getting the actual mid data, um, there's an intermediary data set, which is sometimes but not always distributed, called the um, Militarized Interstate Dispute Source Data, which um, includes uh, essentially headlines from stories that, that describe these events. So it's actually the, the ground truth stories that the coders use to code MIDs. Um, in this case, between 1992 and 2002, there are 257 headlines that, des that describe 36 events. And so that's multiple headlines per unique event. Um, and if we were to take every unique event or incident um, and look at all of the headlines that describe that event and then draw a link between them because they're describing the same event. So you have these little fully connected subgraphs. Uh, you would get 34,398 links, right? Um, so now we have ground truth on um, stories, that is news stories that describe militarized events and the links between those news stories. Um, I also needed negative examples, right? So we need news stories that describe things that aren't militarized interstate disputes um, and then therefore could not have equality links between them. Um, so what I did was I, I crawled uh, the New York Times Spider Bites website um, and I took just the headlines from World News uh, between 1992 and 2002. So these should look a lot like the news story headlines from MIDS, but they probably aren't. And in fact, I threw away any that overlapped. Um, so I, I sampled at a rate of about five to one. So I got 19,211 headlines. These may or may not describe MIDS, um, 
but we're going to assume that they don't describe uh, MIDs and we're going to assume that there are no links between them because of that. Um, and for those who aren't familiar, this is a great resource that I discovered. Um, the uh, Spider Bites is just like, it's all of the free articles on New York Times in an archive dating back to 1851. Um, and there, I think I have collected 4 million or so of them. So, so there are a lot, right? Um, it's not everything, but there's a lot of good text here. And then I, you know, as you can see, some of them are like obituaries and things. And so I threw those away and I just kept the stuff that was in the world section. Um, okay, so this is what the data set looks like. Um, there are two parts to the data set. There are features which describe the events themselves. And then there's a graph that describes the, the relationship between those features. So here's an example. This is a story from the New York Times. It's JSON formatted um, data. Um, it's not a mid, so that's false. And then it has the text of the headline, essentially. There's not content from the articles because I don't have that. Um, it's just the headlines. You could get the content of the articles from the New York Times, um, but I didn't have it from the MIDS data set. So I just use the headlines here. Um, and then the graph just describes, you know, headline A, headline B, and then one or zero co-reference or not co-reference. Okay, um, so I'm gonna talk real briefly about modeling this, um, and then I'll tell you how you can get the data set. So um, in addition to, uh, to, to providing the data set, I, I tried to model this as well, to come up with a model that could do better than chance at, at essentially predicting both events and co-references. Uh, so I used the multitask convolutional neural network. Um, it has three outputs. Uh, the first is the probability that headline A is a militarized interstate dispute given the headline text. Uh, the second is just the probability headline B is a mid. Um, those are essentially the same model. It's just two inputs and two outputs. Uh, and then uh, finally, the probability that there's a co-reference link between headline A and headline B given the two headlines and the the difference in date between the headlines. Um, so it looks like this. Uh, this is in the paper, so I won't spend much time, time on it, but there are three inputs, headline A, headline B, the date. Um, I've substituted uh, word embeddings from fast text for the headlines because it was easy um, and fast. Uh, it'd probably work better if you use something like BERT or ELMO, um, but I used fast text. Um, okay, and then the outputs, yeah. So outputs are just probability of mid, probability of mid, and then probability of co-reference. Now, uh, results. So, so this is the graph that you get. So if you just plotted all of the test set events that have links. So I've omitted all of the, um, all of the like unlinked events here, right? Anything that was predicted not to have a link to any other event. Um, all of the ones in white are actual mids. All of the ones in black are not mids. Uh, this, this section here in the middle, um, all of those little white nodes are all from the militarized interstate dispute data set and they all describe the second Congo war. Uh, these two down here uh, describe the uh, conflict between Uganda and Sudan. Uh, there are a few false positives. So events D and C here, for example, those are headlines from New York Times that do not describe the second Congo war, but are nonetheless predicted to be in that like, cluster, right? Um, and there are mids missing here, right? So there are, because I only plotted the ones that are graphed, I believe there are two mids that are totally missed because um, they aren't predicted to be militarized interstate disputes and there aren't links predicted between them. Um, so how does it work? Uh, the answer is eh, a little better than chance, not great. Um, so, so this particular model, you can see um, it's, uh, it's precision is, is not bad for mids and predicting mids and links between mids, uh, but it's uh, the recalls, not great, right? So as far as mids go, it gets roughly 20% of them. Um, and as far as links go, uh, because it gets that one really big mid, which is highly connected, um, it gets 45% of the links uh, out, of, out of all of the links, right? It gets 45% of them. Um, so it's not horrible. It's not great. You, you probably don't want to rely on this as like ground truth data. Um, but uh, for that reason, uh, I decided to distribute the data so you guys can, can go get it and play with it and make better models than I did. Um, so if you want to play with these data, they're on um, Harvard Dataverse uh, already. It, they're divided into a training, a test, and a validation set already. Um, that's six data sets total. So there's like a graph and the features for each of them. Um, and you can go to this link right here if, if you're interested. Um, if you do, let me know. I would love to know if anybody is, is using, is going to use this data set. Um, but there are a few problems with it as it is right now. Um, so I had to rely on MIDS 3.0 because those were the only um, sources, like the, the source data that were distributed by the, the Correlates of War project and the MIDS project. 
Um, and that is like a limited number of militarized interstate disputes. And a lot of them don't even have headlines. A lot of them are just like, oh, New York Times, page three. And that's it, right? And so you'd have to go find the New York Times and find the headline that they're referring to, um, which you could do. Um, but a better thing to do would be to get the more updated source data from MIDS 4.0. So I got that, um, which is great. I have tons of MIDS and tons of uh, headlines that we can use to make a better data set. But the documents aren't linked to the MID identifiers for some reason, which is crazy. Um, so we're going to have to do that kind of manually, which is, is what I'm working on right now. Um, and so, uh, but the good news is that because I'm linking the headlines to the MIDs manually, uh, I can also collect, I think, most of the full texts as well. I probably can't distribute them, but we'll figure out something in the future if people are interested in using these data so that uh, you can also do research with these if you're using, uh, if you need the full text. Um, so that's what's next. Hopefully it will have a better version of these data soon. Um, but in the meantime, if you're interested, uh, the 1992 to 2002 uh, range of data are, are available already. Um, and uh, that's it. That's, that's the whole presentation. So um, again, I'm Ben. Uh, I'm happy to take your questions now or you can email me. Um, I love talking about event data. So uh, it's really exciting to, uh, to meet everybody and see so many people interested in event data as well. Um, thank you. Thank you too, Ben. Uh, it's quite uh, extensive work and I think it's an invaluable uh, effort. Uh, we can get, uh, we have some time. We have at least uh, nine minutes. If anybody has any question or comment, uh, maybe who think uh, it can be a useful resource for their own research. Anybody? Yeah, it becomes quite technical when, <laughs> when the <laughs> presentation is technical. Uh, maybe people reserve their time to read the details first. Uh, I read the paper in detail and uh, actually I was uh, one of the reviewers. Uh, therefore, uh, many questions were already answered. <laughs> uh, Risto has some question, one of our organizers that is uh, more behind the scenes, uh, but really... Uh, um. May I ask Mr. Redford, uh, how, how did he uh, measure the, um, the link between the, what, what are the features with uh, which uh, he, he, he found out uh, that um, one event is, uh, causes another event? So what is, what, what is the predominant features, which, uh, the, the main feature which, uh, which, which are important for, for this kind of relation? Yeah, yeah. So, um... So good question, uh, and, and sorry this wasn't wasn't so clear in my my talk. Um, so I, I think um, so so I think the answer is um, that that the only event like links that I'm looking at are are equality, right, or like duplicates. So that is um, I don't know. I, I think ultimately it'd be great if we could look at like causal linkages between events. Um, right now it's just do these two articles describe the same event, um, and so. I got like ground truth data on that from, uh, like I said, the militarized interstate dispute data set. So they have, um, they essentially have a, uh, like a, a notebook where the human coders have gone through thousands of headlines, right? Thousands of, of New York Times and various other headlines. And, and they have, if they've used that headline to inform their coding of an event in the data set, that is they've looked at the headline and they said, oh, this headline describes a militarized dispute, number 4339, um, they, they mark that. And so you've got this list of headlines that is you know, 10,000 headlines long, and each headline is associated or not associated with a militarized interstate dispute. But many headlines are associated with the same dispute. So there might be 50 headlines that are all associated with 4339. Um, and so I just used that co-association to make links, right? So now I have 50 headlines, each one of them describes the same event. And so there's a link between all of the different headlines in this data set. So that turns into like a huge amount of, of links, right? And so fortunately there aren't very many mids that, that have 50, 50 headlines, right? They're like 10 or 20 headlines for the most part. Um, yeah, so, so that's how I made links. And then I made like negative links by, by throwing in news articles that are, are not related to militarized interstate disputes at all. They could still describe the same event, but because they're not describing militarized interstate disputes, um, they aren't linked to one another. 
Uh, I hope that answers your, your question. Yes, yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It answers completely. Thank you. Great. Uh, we have a comment and a question from Leonard Raleigh. Uh, maybe she can tell us uh, more. Sure. Um, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Um, and it's always nice to hear about new innovative ways to improve context. So um, I was just wondering about your democratization comment, if you can maybe reflect on which way that democratization is going. Oh, yeah. So I, I think of it, and, and maybe this is the wrong way to think of it, uh, but, but I think of it, so I see your, your comment here. Um, I think of it as democratizing the, the way that, you know, graduate students in the West can, can build their own data projects, right? Um, I, which is not, I, I don't at all want to diminish the importance and the, you know, much higher quality of manually curated kind of expensive data projects that involve um, that involve incorporating local partners and um, and organizations and in in kind of like local areas that you're coding right in in things that are not just like New York Times articles, um, but that's a I think obviously not really scalable for like poor graduate students or even assistant professors who don't have like huge amounts of money to like do these things. Um, and, and I think while it's great to have these data sets that are, are manually curated, um, there's a limit to how many we can have. Um, and I think that kind of forces us to place a lot of faith in the quality of those data sets, right? And even if you believe in the conceptualization of what they're measuring and it's exactly what you're interested in as a researcher which may or may not be the case um and you believe in like the quality of all of the, the sources and you believe in the quality of the coders and the review and everything um i still think there's probably some uncertainty that we want to be able to measure in in kind of our ability to observe the state of the world right um and hopefully ideally if we had more data sets we could better understand some of that uncertainty. So, so for example, right, when you have conflicting reports or news reports, um, over time, right, maybe those news reports converge to like a tr true state of the world, um, but maybe they don't, right? And if you're just gonna code a kind of a single number value in a single data set for each one of those, you know, events, um, you're assuming kind of a, a true final story right that, that's correct and um, I'm not always sure that's like the best way to do it it'd be nice if we had several data sets that coded um, kind of best guesses at those things so that we can understand the overall uh, kind of observer uncertainty in the state of that event right um, that's kind of how I see it maybe maybe I'm I might be the only one I don't know um, but, but yeah, I, I didn't mean it necessarily in, in the sense that we're democratizing like how people in conflict areas get their stories told or get, get kind of information about their local state out to the world. I meant it more in terms of how we as researchers um, produce data about the world. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Just my few cents. Um, for, in our project, we, uh, when we started from like level zero, we don't have anything. And if I automate something and I say, okay, the machine says this, uh, it is impossible to convince any uh, uh, social scientist that it is the correct way. They will use it because this is what they paid for, bad, good or bad. Uh, but uh, it has been three years and uh, the more uh, we, can uh, add uh, human eyes, uh, it is better uh, we can understand whether it is high quality, therefore we are in the effort of shared tasks and these workshops, uh, both uh, theoretically and practically. Uh, but uh, the money has, uh, and the time has some limits. And when I just assume I leave uh, all what I did, systems and the project, money uh, ended so how uh, is it going to be uh, updated uh, or human resource is not available anymore so i would find the democratization at least in uh, when you start from scratch or when you have uh, or it can be 
automation and people would help each other. Uh, when we get a random sample, uh, it is not easy for people to annotate. But if we use active learning, it helps them. Uh, so uh, we, sh we are, everybody tries to find its own, uh, based on everybody's settings, they're trying to find the optimal point between this precision and recall uh, and the necessity requirement of the project. So it is a continuous effort and I hope tomorrow uh, uh, one of the leading uh, researchers, uh, Philip Schrott, will tell us even more and uh, I hope we will be confused enough at the end of the workshop. So until the next event, it can be better. Uh, we won't have time to think about all these uh, dimensions. So uh, if no, anybody has any comment or question, we, the session will be open 15 minutes more. Thank you very much for joining and hope to see you tomorrow as well. And please let us know about anything we can do for you, with you. Okay. Have a nice day. Bye, everyone. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Goodbye. Thanks.